everybody and welcome to the One Bookshelf Twitch. Thank you for watching. This week we are streaming DMs Guild Community Jam. It's our first one ever. Um, and Community Jam is all about jamming with some awesome, are they in this direction? This direction. Uh, creators on Dungeon Masters Guild. Um, yes, very literally jamming in some cases about different topics. And this week to start us off, since it's our first one, we're just talking about getting started on Dungeon Masters Guild. I I am your host, Lisa Penrose. I am the brand manager for Dungeon Masters Guild. Um, and let's do start, let's start with some introductions. So I'll pass to Justice. Let folks know who you are, what titles they might know you from, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, hi, I'm Justice Armin. Uh, I am a writer and a goblin at Beetle and Grimm's. Um, I have written a bunch of things for the DMs Guild and, and co-led some supplements uh, along with Sadie, like um, Dark Hold Secrets of the Zentarium. Uh, Devil's Advocate, A Guide to Infernal Contracts, and my milk-themed carnival horror, Step Right Up. My favorite, slash <laughs> my least favorite, a horror. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, we should say what our favorite jams are. Mine is an orange marmalade. What's yours? Ooh. Uh, I think my favorite jam is Blackberry. Okay, yum, a good choice. Mm -hmm. Sadie, who are you? Hello, uh, I'm Sadie. I am a writer, editor, sometimes artist on the DMs Guild. People mostly know me through my Eberron adventures, through Eyes Unclouded, Darkhold that I did with Justice, which was amazing. Um, and generally just yelling about grammar and writing uh, into the Twitter void occasionally. Um, I Favorite jam is really hard. I like a good cherry jam, I think. Uh, cherry is really, really good. I have, uh, I brought two uh, I have a homemade huckleberry, what? and I don't know if this is blackberry or blueberry. My mother gave it to me. So, chat, tell me which one I should put on my pancakes, huckleberry or the mysterious <laughs> Very bee jam. Very important things happening mm -hmm. right now. Is huckleberry a real berry? It is. Wow. I'm learning so much. Well, remember, <laughs> Justice didn't know about red onion jam either. He didn't know that uh, onion jam mm. was a thing. Mm -mm. I didn't know onion jam was a thing, but I'm not surprised it's a thing. Mm. It's, yeah, I feel like it's most a things thing. can be jammed. Mm. Mm, okay, whatever. I uh, <laughs> don't know if I like that I said that. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for witnessing my embarrassment. Also, as we discuss getting started on Dungeon Masters Guild, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in chat. Put QUESTION in all caps so it's easy for our mods to catch it, and they'll be collecting the questions for us to answer. Uh, possibly as we go, if they kind of make sense and continue the discussion, or we'll save a little bit of time at the end to do some Q&A uh, as well. But to start us off, Justice and Sadie, I just wanted to know what led to you publishing on Dungeon Masters Guild? What gave you the crazy idea of, I'm going to write a and d thing myself? I know uh, I'll, I'll call on folks to start Justice. <laughs> um, so I... I I usually take really uh, detailed campaign notes and uh, I was doing an annual Halloween one shot uh, and I, I thought it would be cool to type it up and share it with people. So I put it up on the guild as a, a pay what you want title. And then I forgot about it for like, I think seven or eight months until uh, MT Black was doing this one page adventure contest. And after I finished that, he asked for your DMs guild email. So I logged in and I was like, what? I have money. Why do I have money? <laughs> Somebody hacked me. Somebody gave me money. It's wrong. What is this? And, and so I guess I had started before I even realized it, which was a lot of fun. And I kept writing from there. That's awesome. What about you, Sadie? Uh, I, I've been trying to remember what it was that kind of crossed my Twitter that made me uh, see the RPG Writers Workshop. Uh, I guess I was... I was running an art Twitter and there were, and some artists were D and D artists. And so slowly those spheres started colliding. Uh, I saw a, an ad for the RPG writers workshop and I went, I want to do that. I could totally do that. And it was all uphill from there. Um, that's amazing. And I, I didn't do this on purpose, but I love that both of you, you're, you're, well, I guess just as you had started before you knew, uh, really, but both of you kind of started because of the community and projects that the community had put together. Ashley Warren's RPG Writer Workshop and Empty Black's Lonely Scroll Contest. Um, that's a, like, I feel like that's a really special part of 
DM skill. That I mean, it's a marketplace and a license and and blah blah blah. But it's also a really strong community of creators. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, FN Dungeon Mom has a, a kind of a good next question. Um, so I'll interject with that. What do you think is the best place to start? Adventures, supplements, classes. What are your thoughts? I think that adventures are a good place to start personally because whether or not you're you've been studying D and D your whole life, right? Whether or not you've been playing since its inception and you started back in three point five e, we all know stories. We all watch movies. We all read books. We all you know we all consume stories in some sort of format. And so, even if you even if you're coming in and trying to learn about, well, how do I make a subclass? How do I make magic items? How do I balance uh, DM tools? Uh, even if you're still trying to learn that, the I feel story is a, a universal bridge between media and TTRPGs. It's it's a very seamless transition from creating, for, mm-hmm. for creating, I think, uh, from creating just stories to creating stories that people will run as adventures. I think that's a really easy gap to cross. That's a really great point. Like, um, even if you don't know anything necessarily about mechanics, half of adventure is the stories. And so you're coming into it knowing something. um, And then you just have to learn uh, mechanics and how to create, kind of create a manual to play the story. that's awesome. What about you, Justice? Um, <clears throat> I, I think I think start with something small. No matter what you do, just make sure that you, you have a defined endpoint. Uh, I think the hardest part when it comes to your first DM Guild product is starting. And then the second hardest part is following through and, and actually publishing it. Um, so I, m- my second project that I guess I released, the first thing that I knew I was releasing on the DM Guild was just a uh, like a Norse themed subclass, which um, didn't take too much effort to kind of get that written, um, which was nice to be able to start a project and end it in the same month. Great, nice. So let's talk about what you all decided, and just as you just touched on a little bit about your first title. Tell me what was it about and what was your creation process like when you're trying to navigate this for the first time? And then what was the publishing process like? Kind of a three pronged question. Uh, Justice, you want to start with this one? Cause you kind of touched on it a little. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so the creation process was very hectic. Uh, I, w- I wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, so the hardest, the hardest part of it for me was finding the people that could do the stuff that I couldn't, um, you know, I didn't know who could do layout. I didn't know what to ask for when it came to layout. I didn't know anything about editing. Um, so when it came to actually writing the thing and, and feeling like I was done, I was ready to share it, but all I had were words and nobody ever wants to just read your words. They want to see a picture, you know, they want to see it on a, you know, on the, the page that's kind of like parchment and stuff like that. Um, I forgot the whole question, but there are three parts to it. And I feel like I haven't answered any of those three parts. <laughs> you talked about one, the creation process. Creation and then what process. was it like actually like getting it ready to publish and then publishing it? Getting it ready to publish. Um I think when it was getting it ready to publish, I was basically just kind of um, going back and forth with uh, with the layout person. I had kind of an idea uh, in my mind of what it looked like. It was about two pages. Um, I had went onto the drive through RPG and had heard about um, some of the free art resources there. Um, and the cover is actually like some 17th century painting uh, of, of Thor because um, it's the Oath of the Aesir. And so my, my big thing was like keeping the budget low. And um, so I think all in all, as far as art, I spent maybe like five bucks on that supplement, nice. which was really manageable. Um, so kind of communicating with him to, to say, uh, uh, you know, where is this piece going to go? I kind of want this one up here. This is the kind of look I want it to be familiar. Um, and then uh, making sure I had the DM skill logo on the cover so that it didn't get uh, taken down. One of the most <laughs> important things. The most important thing. <laughs> Don't forget the logo. Yeah. Well, what about you, Sadie? Tell us about your first, I guess it was RPG Raider Workshop. So adventure, first mm-hmm. adventure? Yeah. So I had made um, 
A Darkness from the Stars, which is an Eberron adventure that takes place in the Star Peaks Observatory. And it was an interesting process. I remember being, uh, when I had dragged my friend Amber into the workshop with me, she knew immediately what she wanted to do. She said, I want to do a gothic horror adventure. And I went, uh, I'll catch up at some point. <laughs> uh, and one day I was driving home and um, I had been reading about Eberron and I was like, okay, well, I like dragons and I like stars and I like space and I like observatories. Let's do this thing. Um, I think the process was a little bit, how do I say this? It was, I think when you're first jumping in and you don't know what questions, you don't know what you don't know. You don't mm -hmm. know what to ask. You don't know what, uh, you know, we had the, the workshop and it had these really helpful lessons, but I, there was so much that I didn't know. But what was really helpful for me, and I think what's really helpful for new people is that once you publish that first thing, and you realize what the steps are, it's so much easier after that because every, I, I did I did basically everything myself that first go around. Mm -hmm. I did the writing, uh, I did the layout in GM binder, I drew my own cover. Uh, I had my hands in every piece of that pie. Uh, and while I don't think it made the most polished and like professional product because I was a one woman team aside from Amber who read it for me, uh, aside from that, kind of being able to cross that gap and go, okay, I just did all of these pieces and got something on DMs Guild and have people buy it. I can totally continue doing this. Um, so I guess that's like my creation process is just do it. Um, your, your first product is never going to be your magnum opus. It's never going to be the thing that defines you. So get everything get it on dm's guild no matter what it takes and then once you know what you don't know and what you can improve and you know what you can collaborate on next time like justice was talking about from there you can only go up yeah that's a great point that you're that first title is very much a learning experience and it probably serves you to think of it as that kind of take some of the pressure off um, again, you both touched on this a bit, but in case you had anything else to add, what lessons did you learn from that first title or what do you wish you knew, uh, then that you knew that, you know, now? Hmm. I think, I think it's important to like start scoping out people to work with before you start writing, um, to whenever, because a, a tweet's average lifetime is something like 20 minutes. Um, so when you see somebody come up on your timeline who ha has laid out a project or um, has an art style that you enjoy or says they just wrote something with with a, a mechanic or a theme that you can hear my dog wagging off uh, <laughs> um the uh I totally lost my train of thought anyway or uh you know the art um or or um you know, a theme of something they've written, I would jot their name down uh, for the future um, because when it comes time to you know, go to layout or go to art or find an editor, uh, it can some kind, sometimes feel a little, um, you know, stressful. You're like, how do I find this person? You know, how do I ask them what to do? You, you kind of just want to be able to hand them it and be like, hey, can you do editing on this? Can you do art? Like, so having that roster, I think would have been uh, a lot more helpful early on. Nice. Yeah, I think knowing that how collaborative the community really is uh, there are so many people who are so skilled and so willing to not just work with you but lend their advice and their expertise and uh, collaborate just for the sheer joy of collaboration uh, knowing that is uh, the more people that come in and get folded into the community before their first title and get to experience that the better off our hobby is going to be um, and I love that the initiatives that the community takes to reach out and encourage and look for new creators and offer to help them. I remember being in the workshop and basically going and, and it's like it's embarrassing looking back because I I I was an I am an editor professionally, but I didn't quite know the style guide uh, as much as I'd wanted to at the time. But I remember being in the workshop and that that collaborative experience. I remember being like, hey, if anyone wants a free editor for their adventure, like I'll I'll take one or two, hit me up. Mm -hmm. And I had like two or three people message me 
And that's the kind of relationship that we have and that we continue fostering and that we try to foster is, you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I love you're such an eloquent speaker and I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's part of what I really like about the DMs Guild community that, like you said, most people, well, pretty much everyone who I think is like really active in the community really wants to help new creators and gets excited when there's people who's like, who are like working on their own, their first thing and need some encouragement. Um, if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I get involved in this community? There's hashtag DMs Guild on Twitter. That's really active. Um, there is a Facebook group for DMs Guild creators. If you just look up Dungeon Masters Guild, RPG Writer Workshop is a fantastic community. Uh, they have a Discord and then Drive Through RPG, our sister site, uh, also has a Discord, um, and there's a number of Dungeon Masters Guild creators on there as well. Um, I kind of want to dive into a few of the questions, though, that people are asking, because I feel like they fit in really well here. Um, so, Justice, you had mentioned collaboration. Uh, Rage Cage wants to know, what is your process for collaboration? How did you first get started with collabs? And then how did you get onto some of the larger collab projects you've done? First off, I love the name Rage Cage, <laughs> uh, super metal. Um, so I think my, fir my first real collaboration was um, on a project called Hellbound Heists led by Brian Holmes. Um, it was designed to go after Descent to Avernus. We were all doing a heist theme adventure set in each one of the nine hells. Um, so the first kind of thing I would say when starting a collaboration you know, when that invitation comes out, that open call, if you can find one or somebody says, hey, I'm writing this and you think it's a project you're interested in, have something to show, whether it's a past product, um, some sort of writing sample, or even write something generally or, or pitch them an idea that, that goes with the theme of their uh, project that you saw. Um, the best way I feel like to learn how to collaborate is to first start at the, you know, the smallest kind of commitment level you can. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily start by leading a large collaboration. I would maybe participate in one where you're submitting something rather small and then slowly level up to something where now you're on a smaller project with less collaborators, but you're each doing something larger. And then finally, when you've, you know, participated in one or two of those and you've learned from, you know, uh, project managers that you respect and uh, admire that you can take some of those lessons you've learned um, and pay it forward to invite others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are community projects all the time. Uh, if you look for these discords that we're talking about and uh, on, in the community on Twitter, there are people, uh, my first collaborative projects were uh, Steph Stevens, Jeff Stevens, Steph Stevens, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Justice jinxed you. I know. Um, <laughs> you called me eloquent and this is what happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Jeff Stevens reached out to me to be a part of Encounters in the Savage Underdark. Uh, and then at the same time, there was a um, a fundraiser, a charity project going on. We ended up calling it Wisdom Under Fire. It was for the Australian wildfires. And those were so little on my part. It was, you know, write a thousand words, write an encounter, write an NPC. But in doing that, I was able to network with a bunch of people, put a little bit more work out there and learn how these collaborative processes work. And that's, those were stepping stones to the Adventures Domestic Handbook and then Justice and Anthony inviting me onto Darkhold Secrets of the Centrum. And then from there so don't be afraid to start small and look for community charity projects um, people are always looking for not just collaborators but also new faces um, i see calls go out all the time that's you know if this is your first product i want to hear from you so mm -hmm. look for those Absolutely. Um, gosh, I feel like there was something I wanted to say about collab. Oh, I wanted to say that. So Justice said he'd recommend that you join a collaborative project uh, before. Like, don't make your first project necessarily wrangling a bajillion people and project managing on top of everything else. That would that would 99% of the time be in my advice, too. But if you've seen Eyes Unclouded, if I'm remembering correctly, Bridey, who project managed that and helped make Eyes Unclouded happen, that was uh, her first 
Dungeon Masters Guild project, which is mind blowing to me and so yeah. cool. Uh, she did so, amazing. Yeah. She, I, I was on it, and oh, it yeah. was, <laughs> it was like she did incredible. So I had met her back in the RPG Writers Workshop Discord. So again, networking and p- paying attention to who's around you, and she had floated the idea months ago and we had all been like that would be so cool keep us in mind that would be awesome i would totally be a part of that months later uh she decided she wanted to go ahead and run that and uh, you know i really was impressed with the the, how organized she was so she had a whole schedule written out she had how she was going to do her royalties um she was very on top of deadlines um and so if you think if you have the organizational skills and you have people like I think a lot of the un, not a lot of I don't know actually the number, but several of the eyes unclouded contributors were people from the workshop who were also just getting started. So, you know, if you are looking for people who are also looking for collaborative projects and who also don't know how to get their foot in the door, eyes unclouded is the perfect example of a bunch of people going Let's make an anthology and it working because she was on top of everything. Yeah. Anthologies very much, I feel, become greater than the sum of their parts. Because like you mentioned, you mentioned that Bridie was super organized. So she's able to bring those skills that are so important to a really good anthology. And then some folks might be really good editors. And so they can contribute. Some folks might be really good at one style of encounter. And some other folks bring a totally different style so that there's variety. I brought Um, my cookbook (laughs) editing. I was able to edit the rest because that's what I do for my day job. (laughs) Amazing. Yeah, that's really, really cool. What would you say, both of you having done collaborative projects, what makes someone a good collaborator? Um, I, so there's this there's this poll back in 2012 that Gallup did for like the best places to work. I'm gonna get all businessy on. Yeah, do it. Um, And they distilled these these amazing companies where everybody said they loved working for them. Um, to these 12 questions and and uh, the top three, um, I always think about the, the, I think the number one is, do I know what's expected of me uh, at work? So uh, good collaborators, um, you know, they communicate well, they, they say, this is going to be due by this day. Um, if you're a project manager, uh, it's due by this day. Here are the expectations. Here's a template you can use. I need you to use this template. It should be about this long. Please don't go over or under because of these reasons. Um, it's all easily accessible. Um, and for the for the collaborator, it's it's timeliness. It's knowing what's required of you. It's asking questions when you're unsure of what's mm-hmm. required of you because um, a lot of us are just individuals and. Um, we're writing TTRPGs either on the side or in addition to a lot going on in our lives. So, you know, kind of giving a little bit, a bit of grace there and, uh, and just communicating and asking those questions will, will go a long way. Um, I think that, you know, going back with Eyes Unclouded, that being like that first project that they led, there's nothing separating, you know, someone who has, you know, 20 mithril sellers under their belt and somebody just starting out, you can, you can knock a project out of the park right off the bat. Um, Mm -hmm. You just have to be organized and communicate and uh, be passionate about it. Yeah. I, I always say like communication is the most important thing, but I love that you called out knowing what is expected of you, like expectations from like the different folks, which um, it stops any like surprises from Mm -hmm. happening, which really makes communication and working together super smooth. Well, and I think it's important to remember that most people are doing this as a hobby on the side. And most people aren't doing this full time. I know of a few people who are doing this full time, but they are very few and far between. So what that communication and those expectations up front help is making sure that these projects aren't taxing people more than they were originally meant to keeping that scope small and manageable because the the projects that i've had a hard time working on or that i've seen and heard of having a hard time are the projects where it ran away from them and it never got finished because 
it didn't have a clear goal and clear deadlines and a clear word count and a clear direction. Every, every time I've struggled, it's because those parameters weren't set out. And so remembering that people are doing this as a, as a hobby on the side of their real, not real lives, but their, their professional lives and their outside world lives, you know, it's, you kind of owe it to your collaborators to make sure that their process of working with you is as streamlined and clear and smooth as possible, that it stays manageable in scope, that the deadlines are met, that they are paid on time. If you're paying mm -hmm. them, um, you owe it to them to, you know, really make sure that the project is what they signed on to do and that it gets accomplished in the way that they signed on to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I think that for a project manager, the there there's this thing in like um, in process improvement where say you're working a factory uh, and you want to maximize all of the time when the machines are running. You do a lot of uh, of upfront work there, and there's this idea of like what can you externalize, what can you remove from the time that the project is actually going on, so that you save time and you make the most of the people and the machines that are working on it. And I think that applies to project leadership. It's you want to you want to externalize all of that work up front so that there's a hub that people can tune in. It's very clear how to communicate. They know what to do when they're unsure. Um, and and I'm sure that for Eyes Unclouded with Sadie talking about how organized the project was, that there was a ton of upfront work that went into that project before anyone was ever really invited to write. I think so. I think so. I mean, Brady, Brady had Google Docs ready and spreadsheets and yeah, absolutely. Oh, that just makes me happy. Like, like, you know, when you see like a really perfect organized picture yeah. or like things like laid out really neatly, that gives me that sense of peace. I love like a color coded that. spreadsheet. Uh. Ashley, if you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, I'm going to shift us over to another awesome question, which I actually feel like gets asked a lot um, from new creators, especially. Hoopy RJ wants to know, what's the best way to learn how to format for Dungeon Masters Guild so a project looks like official? Oh, read hardcovers, first of all. Uh, <laughs> um, so you, how do I say this? Okay, so in in the book publisher, that I work at. Uh, and this is this is actually kind of leads into larger advice that I have, but I'll try to keep it small. We we get what's called comp titles when we are in, in acquiring or creating a book. We get what we call comp titles, and that's what are other people doing? What do their books tend to look like? Uh, it's analyzing the competition, essentially. Um, and we consider comp title research really important. So we are constantly asking ourselves, you know, why did they choose this cover? And what, why did they choose that trim size? Why did they choose that page count? Why did they, why did they do the book like this? And why did it sell as well as it did? And so when you're making a new project and you want it to look legitimate and you want it to look professional, do your comp title research, essentially. You, you want to, there is no shame. And in fact, I highly encourage getting official D, D hardcovers and looking at them purely to look at their layout if there are products that you admire like i have been staring at gordon's layout work on darkhold for months now because it was stunning um if there's a creator that you really really like and you like their style learn from that you're doing your comp title research essentially you are seeing why did this work for this person why did this cover and this font style and this specific page pattern work for this why did this you know why did these colors work really well for this product um and then learning how to do layout is a little bit harder but i can tell you that there are templates uh on dm's guild uh nathaniel rue uh does both um I think InDesign, Affinity Publisher, Laura Herzbrunner has a word template. Um, those are fantastic gateways to learning to do layout because they have a lot of it right there already. So if you want to learn to do basic layout, those are a great place to get started and then do your comp title research as you start experimenting with more official, still official looking, but a little more out of the box 
um, layouts. Mm -hmm. Justice, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, so I I am terrible at layout in that uh, I don't have any programs that can do it. <laughs> uh, so I usually I usually um, hire someone to do layout. Um, which if you have the resources for that, I you know I recommend it. I trade time for you know being able to um, sacrifice a little bit of money to do that. Um, and when I guess from the flip side of when asking someone to to format something for you, since Sadie has covered like how to do it yourself or with a template. Um, it's just just know what you're asking for. If you provide those examples to say, I kind of want it to look like this, but with this sort of theme. Um, and I think that uh, you have to you have to know what what you're kind of um, going for with your supplements. Like, do you want to be super strict to the D and D look? Do you want to have the same you know kind of water stained pages and very similar fonts, um, or do you want to go against the grain a little bit and uh, you know make a layout like? Uh, that weekend at Strahd's that Anthony and Oliver did um, that Gordon also did the layout for that, where the it's super eighties and looks like, you know, a Greyhound bus seat vomited onto a page, um, <laughs> but it works. It works for that title. Um, so I, I love original layouts that look a little bit different. Big um, same. Yeah. They, um, it's just cool. It catches your eye. You don't have to put a parchment, you know, on the back of every page. In fact, people's printers will probably thank you if you don't. <laughs> True. Um, and there are unique and interesting layouts being done all the time now. Um, Marco, Marco's Flight of the Magpies was oh, yeah. lauded for its really original and sleek layout. So when I, you know, when I'm, when I talk about doing comp title research, it's not even just for how to do an official D and D hardcover look, although it does help that, kind of keeping your eye out to what other people are publishing can only strengthen your layout senses and help you to tell a layout person, I want that look, or I want, you know, what, what they achieved here. I would love to see that happen. Um, you know, it, there's no shame in, in being aware of what's happening around you. Yeah, I'd also recommend if you haven't already looked at the popular Uncaged anthology, mm -hmm. I really like it has like a very clean, um, but unmodern uh, layout style rather than trying to mimic the typical 5e parchment fantasy mm -hmm. style. And um, Uncaged also incorporates some like fantasy photography uh, rather than yeah. illustration, and um, which I think is pretty cool. I think um, I think Uncaged, if I remember, it, like even goes a little bit against the grain of like the traditional formatting and like provides some really helpful information up front so you can get, a, you know, kind of a snapshot at what each of those adventures is, which is super helpful. So you don't have to read like 20 pages of D&D text in order to <laughs> see what's happening here. And that's that's actually a good, another good point, Justice, is that layout doesn't even just mean how it looks on a page. But when, you know, when you're, I learned so much from watching how other people lay out their adventures in terms of what do they put up front? How do they organize their information? Um, how do they make sure that the DM knows what they're doing when they're going in? What tools do they give the DM to help run their adventures? Um, you know, do your comp title research, read and study and learn from other people all the time because we have a community of very smart people who are constantly asking themselves, how do we make this community more accessible to new people? And, you know, how do we push the boundaries of, of layout and information? And MT Black's been doing the his box text research lately in what makes good box text. Um, so there is so much that you can learn just by watching how other people do things. Yeah, I get particularly... Miss... Oh, Justice, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I missed when box text was the hottest take. I know! <laughs> <laughs> this has gotten too spicy what for me. Mood, what <laughs> mood. Um, I get really excited when I see titles like Eyes Unclouded, like Uncaged, that are kind of pushing the boundaries of what D&D can be in general. Because I know there's going to be something in their content and how they organize information. They're and um, they're just bringing a fresh view to lots of different aspects of D and D. Um, oh gosh, so many questions are coming in. Okay, Sticky Hunter asked a question that kind of shifts us to the next topic that I wanted to talk about, which was how did you market your first title? Um, Sticky Hunter's question is: What is important info to put in a description for a product? What is a best to focus on? Sadie, go. Justice, is that okay? 
Yeah, it's it's all yours, and I appreciate the hand raising. I like that, and I think we're. I think I want to incorporate that now too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, I book publisher lingo. I'm so excited Ooh. about this. Okay. So, uh, in my opinion, a go- so when we are writing an Amazon page or just a book listing page, um, and I love seeing this on DM Skilled products, the first thing we write is what's called a positioning statement. Know that phrase. Learn that phrase. Remember that phrase. A positioning statement is a one sentence statement. It's, it's, it's fairly, you want to, you want to keep it pretty short, but it's a one sentence summary of what it is you have made. So a good positioning statement, I'm, I'm remembering like real books (laughs) instead of DMs Guild products right now, but like we have one called uh, backyard homesteader and it's like a comprehensive guide to living off the land, um, being, you know, owning a self-sustained household and da, 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 da. It is a one sentence statement that tells you exactly what the product is. Um, so for, for me, um, you know, if I'm doing like adventures, domestic handbook, it would be something like, uh, it would be, you know, a, a new mechanics for homesteading, uh, business owning and relationship building. It needs to be succinct short but packed with information this is a sentence where you don't want a lot of fluffy words right uh and you want that statement right at the top where someone can read it and know exactly what they're getting so when i do a kid's book right it's like teach your children about this famous astronaut through colorful pictures and a rhyming poem or you know 23 subclasses that explore planar energies uh, throughout the forgotten realms. So start with that positioning statement. You want that to be the top thing, leave out all the fluffy words and make sure that that is the first thing on the page. After that, you can start to get a little fluffier. Um, So that's where we, after that, that's when we have our paragraph where we start to get fluffy and beautiful, right? So author so-and-so takes you through a sweeping you know a sweeping exploration of 23 private gardens along the pacific northwest these gardens range from da 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 to da 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 and you know these expansive backyard patio barbecues to your scenic beachfront houses that's where you can get fluffy and that's where you can hype your product and let them know exactly why they want to buy it and pay attention to those those powerful words that make people want to buy things this is essentially marketing this your product page is your main marketing it tells people what they want or what they have why they want it why they should buy it so that's where you say dynamic character classes or you know a thrilling you know adventure that you can run multiple times you want to tell them what it is and why they want it, how it improves their game. A lot of people say to break those down into bullet points for readability. Uh, For DMs Guild, I I think I agree. People are going through products pretty quickly. So break down its key selling points, book lingo, uh, into its key selling points into bullet points. So does it have uh, an interactive PDF? Does it have maps? Does it have custom art? Does it have a printer or a screen reader friendly PDF? Does it have, you know, what, what does it have and why do people want to have it? So what I often see positioning statement, fluffy paragraph, make it sound real pretty, put that, uh, put your key selling points into bullet points and then put some images there. So people get a feel for the look. Some people will put, uh, a preview of a few pages. They'll put uh, just some of the art inside. Uh, so you you do you you can pretty it up. Definitely, you can make it look really pretty and put visuals. But the important thing to remember is that people want to know what they're buying and they want to know why they want it. Uh, so I would you know I wouldn't clutter it up with a bunch of graphics and I wouldn't clutter it up with a bunch of fluffy language. I would make sure that that information is right up front and then worry about all the fluffy pretty stuff later or or talk about the fluffy stuff in your tweets about it you know um that was so cool that was like a <laughs> master class in product descriptions and i feel like i learned a lot for some stuff that i'm working on i'm really excited get fluffy yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Justice, do you have anything to add to that? Or do you want to talk about maybe how you market through like social media? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the last thing I would just say is um, proofread your product page. Make sure the image is loaded correctly. You know, you might need to go in a few times. Don't skip it because that's the thing everybody's going to see before they buy your product. So if you got a typo right there in the beginning, um, my my one of my Google Sheet, you know, Excel professors back in the day was like a typo will not hurt you in the long run, but it will ruin your credibility at the beginning. Oof. Like. Before you move on from typos, I just want to like give one example, kind of combining. So Sadie mentioned putting in like important keywords and making sure people know what they're getting. Justice mentioned typos. So we've got like a sidekick uh, spotlight going on on our website. And we tried searching for sidekicks, sidekicks, trying to gather as many of those titles as we could. And someone messaged me asking, well, hey, why wasn't my title included? And it was because they only mentioned sidekick once in their product description, even though that's what their product was. And it was side space kick so it didn't show up in our searches for our team so we missed out getting to feature them in our promotion so keep track of those two things product descriptions super important mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. you can continue um so so the question was about uh like social media mm -hmm. i think um so i think uh, sadie touched on a little bit there's a there's kind of like a pyramid of values whenever you're marketing something there's the feature as in like what's in this product uh, it is 23 subclasses. There's the benefit, like what do you get out of it? These subclasses are, you know, different themed. They'll save you time. Um, they use new mechanics. And then there's kind of the shared values of, you know, what does this share in common with with me as a person? You know, if, for example, um, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, the, the domestic handbook, it's, it's something that hasn't really been touched on in the game a lot. Um, but, it, you know, you want to share, share those stories, those familial stories uh, in your game and uh, you can talk about family and those values might resonate with with people um, in a different way than just saying, you know, here's the features. Um, so when it comes to, you know, marketing on social media, especially on Twitter, you only have a certain amount of space. Uh, the things the, the big things that are always on my mind when I'm marketing something on Twitter is um to not hit something too much because uh, you, you can't underestimate the uh, the hype train uh, because it comes hard and it leaves fast. Um, when when you've got um, when you've got something that you're excited about and it's coming out in a month, if you tweet about it every day, by the time your 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 supplement releases, a lot of people might not be excited by it anymore. If they feel like they've seen everything that it has to offer, um, they might not check out the page. Uh, so you kind of have to, to, to hold those cards and use them very sparingly, I think. Um, then, uh, you know, use appropriate hashtags, know the difference between Instagram and Twitter hashtags. In Twitter, you really only need two, maybe three hashtags. Um, and if you put a link in that first tweet, um, the algorithm will de incentivize that tweet to get seen a little bit. So you might want to put that link in the follow up um, and then, uh, you know, include images because uh, tweets with images get something like 33% more engagement. Um, you know, make sure you're posting at a good time and, uh, you know, um, learn, I guess, learn patience is a big one for social media. Um, it might not, you know, it might not explode like you want it to. Um, you know, you got to post at the right times during the day. If you post, what are at, right times for you, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, yeah. So I think there was a it, things are a little bit different with the pandemic, um, but I think that the busiest day is Tuesday on a weekday between ten and twelve. Uh, no, 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 nine and eleven Central Time. So I'm in Central Time. So you have to do the math this time. Bring <laughs> <laughs> it, justice. Um, and uh, yeah, so th those are the best times, I think, for engagement. Um, I think historically, the worst times are around uh, five to six ish when people are getting home, they're, you know, they're unwinding, they're not checking their things, they're Making saying dinner. hi to people. Um, and then late at night is a toss up because, you know, there are there are people in like the UK and stuff who will mm -hmm. super engage with tweets sometimes, um, but other times, not so much. Great. Don't be out. like me, nice. don't post art at like one in the morning. Don't do it. <laughs> it's hard because you want to share it. You're like, I just got this cover. Just the finished. art is so amazing. Yeah. I just show this one time. And then you share it. People are like, oh, that's amazing. Where can I buy it? And you're like, 
the product comes out next February. And you're like, <laughs> oh, okay, well, hey, let me know when it comes out. I'll buy it then. And then you never hear from them again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like just said, like maintaining, carefully maintaining that hype. Um, uh, also, look out for, sorry, I'm so sorry. No, don't uh, apologize. Search for communities who would be as excited about your thing as you are because i think one of the main things that helped get me started was i wrote an eberron adventure and i advertised in eberron communities and i made eberron connections who helped me advertise in eberron communities so when you're marketing look for people who are looking for what you're looking for and identify your key audience and think how can i reach them because sometimes yelling into the twitter void is very effective but also, sometimes ta more targeted marketing, uh, looking for specific Reddit forums, Facebook groups, uh, Discord servers, that kind of thing. That can be very effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like get just generally getting engaged in community, it's more enriching for you and then also helps your product succeed. Um, goodness, we have 15 minutes left, so I'm just going to have us jam on these Q&A uh, questions since folks have so many. Scene Render has a great question that gets asked a lot. How do you two deal with writer's block, especially when working with a deadline? Do you have a, a magic, a magic wand or a magical secret to dealing with writer's block? I can go first, Justice, yeah. if you want. Yes, yeah, please tell me your answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a two pronged answer. Ooh. So, number one, Never schedule yourself to the point where you are working so much that you can't also be taking in media uh, because those things that inspire us to create. So for me, books, video games, movies, those things that inspire me, if I go months and months and months and I am just working and I am not taking anything in, it becomes impossible to put my own words on a page. You want to be able to remember why you want to write in the first place. So the most inspired I've been lately is because I have been reading a book called The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. I haven't been reading for ages, but but may, being able to read, playing Hades, how many people do you see on Twitter right now going, I love Hades. Could we do this but Hades? I love Hades. Has anyone out. thought about doing this? Yeah, that tweet yesterday, I was like, I would join a Theros game based on Hades. <laughs> Invite me to that. I will do that. Like, it's like, so how many people are being inspired by Hades? How many people are being inspired by books they're reading or movies? That taking that time to consume and to remember why you love creating and what it is you're trying to say can really help fight that off when you're already in writer's block if it's far too late and you are already gone and you've been working for months and you have a deadline that's where it gets trickier my advice is to um early on when you're creating try to identify ashley is going to be so proud of me when she hears this uh try to identify what processes um create the best work for you do that early on when you're not burned out. So do you write best when you're listening to music or in complete silence? Do you write best when you've blocked all your social media websites or not? Do you write best in the morning or in the evening? When do you uh, create rituals? My boss at work loves to ritualize certain things. So she says before meetings, she will go get herself a cup of tea and that is her reward for being in a meeting um but when she has to write she will ritualize it she will go get herself a snack and then she will write and if you identify those early on then by the time you hit that deadline you already know what sort of creates your peak writing conditions and that can make it easier to get out all the stress and clutter and mental noise of of being that close to a deadline so I know that I do my best work in the morning before everyone else is up because I'm a chatterbug I I love people. I am a social butterfly. So if I try to create when my friends are up and messaging me and talking to me, I will never get anything done. So if I have a deadline, I set my alarm for 6 a.m. and I spend 6 to 7. That's my that's my work hour. And I do nothing but work then. And I make myself a nice drink. I make myself a nice breakfast. And I sit down and I work. Um, so the more work you do to identify your your prime creating conditions 
ahead of time, the more that you can, you know, create that when you're burning out and the more that you can sort of filter away what's really making you struggle. And also be kind to yourself when that doesn't always work because we are in a hell year. Mm -hmm. 2020 has been so horrible to us in so many ways so if you're burnt out recognize that some of that is just not your fault and you can watch everything you want and read everything you want and create make yourself tea and scones and still get to that google doc and find that you don't have any words that day and that's okay um don't beat yourself up about that i always tell my friend that like tasing yourself when you're already down is not ever going to do anything for you it's just going to make you taste um (laughs) don't don't beat yourself up uh i would say figure out what you need to do that day to give yourself a little bit of juice in the battery go what can i do today to take care of myself so that i can do better tomorrow and then Mm -hmm. go do that without guilt just yeah that's really really great advice a lot of it um I especially love that first piece about making sure you're not taking on so many projects that you can't consume media. I feel like a lot of folks will warn about taking on too many projects. Don't take on too many projects that will burn you out or that will overwhelm you. But it's a lot easier to think of time in terms of making sure you also have time for this other stuff. And that kind of stops you like a few steps before total crispy burnout. What tips do you have, Justice? Crispy burnout sounds enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> sounds delicious. <laughs> um, also would be a cool band name. Um, so, Are you yeah, starting so that I, band? I thought, what was that? <laughs> Are you starting that band? Uh, yes. Yeah, I've, I've got two guitars here. I'm going to play them both at the same time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that first piece resonated with me as well. Um, I think we all talk about burnout. We talk about taking on too much and then we inflict it on ourselves continually without taking our own advice. Um, so lately I've been trying to take on less projects so that I have time to do things like that. I've been playing Miles Morales, uh, and I keep a, a book. I mean, I, I, I write all kinds of things in here, my, my Farsi lessons and stuff like that. Um, but whenever I see something that inspires me, um, because I know I'm not always super productive. I'll write it down. I'll say, hey, this would make a good post idea about this. I've already posted like five times today. I shouldn't do it anymore, but this will make great time for tomorrow to post. Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll write, oh, I need a, ooh, a mind flare weapon that eats someone's brain and then you can put it in a, a ray gun. That's a great idea. I don't have something for it right now, but I'm gonna put it here. And then when a project comes up and I'm, you know, super swamped and I'm feeling, like a sponge that's just been wrung out over and over again, I'll pick up this book and I'll say, what ideas do I have here that I thought were really good? Can I work any of them into this? So it kind of goes back to externalizing things because when you're, when you're, you know, running your machine, your writer machine, um, what things did you do before to make that easier? Because I, I don't have an answer for, for helping with writer's block. Uh, I, I get it. And it's, it's brutal. I spent yesterday looking at like one paragraph for like two hours just because I was trying to get the wording perfect. Um, I'd say that um, you, you gotta, you, sometimes you have to take inspiration where you can find it um, and uh, uh, save it for a rainy day. Um, having multiple, uh, having um, projects that you're working on for yourself and that you're not beholden to anyone for can also really help with that, I think, because I find that yes, just yesterday, I was like, I'm going to go work on this thing that I'm working with two other people on and I am going to get all of this done. And I just couldn't, I I couldn't, I was staring at that page and I thought that I am not doing this today. You know what I did do? I went and wrote 2,400 words on a blog post. Whoa. Um, Nice. I always yeah and it was like oh okay all right I guess I can write um but so one of the pieces of advice that Ashley gave me is when you're really beholden to a lot of people make sure that you will one cut down on how many people you're beholden to to a reasonable number please um but uh also have projects for yourself that when you're feeling particularly hard when it's hard to get those words out for someone else if you're able to bounce back and get like a hundred words on your own project that can be really invigorating and it can really having projects to kind of bounce between 
when you're not feeling one, you can go to another. When you're not feeling that one, you can go back to this one. Um, I find that that really helps stay burnout instead of staring at one page and being like, I need to write this page. Mm -hmm. That's not always the most conducive to creating. I feel like there's like an invisible labor that comes with each project. Like it's not just, this is a 500 word assignment. It's, this is a 500 word assignment with all these specifications and getting into the zone, remembering all of that, you know, setting yourself to write for that project. Those kind of stack the more you take on. Um, So if you take three 500 word projects on, it's not a 1500 word project. It's each one of those with this extra little I don't know what to call it, like evil patty or something evil that patty. sits in between them all. <laughs> you have to you have to eat that patty first and yeah. then you can write. I feel like there's also this invisible, I don't know if it's emotional labor or what, of just being beholden to a deadline that you owe someone something. I al- almost imagine mm. them as like little invisible deadline gremlins that are just like on your shoulders. Yeah, exactly. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is from Stephen uh, Pankotai. Pankotai? Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, but the question is, you've both been relatively successful. What, if anything, was the point where you felt like you made it? Ooh. Hmm. Oh, stumped them. Stumped them, Stephen. I think the answer is I don't feel like I've made it. <laughs> I don't. I, I wonder if anyone ever has, ever like feels like it. They have rather. So, I would say, and grain of salt, this really badly because I I don't know. I also don't feel like I've made it. <laughs> um, I every time someone tells me like you you're doing so much you're so cool i'm like i'm not doing nearly enough i have so much more i could be doing i haven't done this and this and this but um i would say i started to feel like i was making it when people started approaching me to work with me and kind of recognizing my skills without me having to flash them out everywhere and be like, hey, please look at me. I can write and edit and draw sometimes. Please look at me. I'm pretty cool, I promise. But even then, I that doesn't stop the imposter syndrome from going, no, I've just tricked this person. They're coming to me and they're asking right. me and they, they could be asking someone else who is so much cooler and so much more ready for this. They why are they asking me? They could be asking anyone else and I'm just going to let them down and I should refer them to somebody else. It, it doesn't stop that. Um, mm. And I don't think, I mean, you could, you could put me on a D and D hardcover and I would probably still ask myself if I could have done better like a, a year later. Um, and that's the nature of creation. They talk about the artist cycle of, um, when you're when you're drawing they talk about your your hand versus your eye so when when your hand is better than your eye you feel really good about your art your you your hand has caught up to what your eye can accomplish right and you your critical eye is like this is perfect this is exactly what i wanted but it's in the nature of art and writing and creation that your critical eye gets better it will always get better as you take in new media and as you watch how other people are doing things and as you hone your senses your eye will always get better so those times when your critical eye improves and you start to realize i need to do this better i need to do this better and people are doing this and i could be doing this but your hand hasn't caught up yet that's when you're dissatisfied with your work and you need to wait until your hand can catch back up and that is a constant process Mm-hmm. It is not just an art. It is an every create every type of creation. Your hand will get better, and then your eye will get better, and then your hand will get better, and then your eye will get better. And as you improve both, it is so cyclical. So when your eye is doing better than your hand, please remember that that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. When you're dissatisfied with your work, it means that your senses have improved. Your critical eye has improved. Your your capacity to understand what makes good work has improved this is not a section of time to be afraid of it just means that you need to work so that this gets back up here and then you push your critical eye again and that's the only way to go this high so 
don't be afraid of not feeling like you've made it or feeling like you could be better. Um, I don't think any of us will ever be like sitting on a golden throne going, I have achieved the height of all creation because that's not in the nature of creation. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I My did it. Magnum What's opus next? is complete. None of us will ever be that way because our critical eye will always be improving. So oh. yeah. great okay. words of wisdom. Yeah. I, I think honestly the time, I think what will make me feel really accomplished. I, I mean, I've done a lot of stuff that I've really been just super jazzed about being able to do. Um, I still have my day job when I'm able to go see my dad who he had a heart procedure earlier this year. Pandemic has made it really hard to get up to Tennessee. Um, he's like 65 when I don't have my day job and I can drive and see him any weekend I want to. I think then I'll feel like I'm, I'm starting to make it. Well, in my eyes, you two are amazing beacons of the D&D design community. I'm so glad I was able to have you both on for the very first Community Jam. Um, this was a wonderful discussion. And I saw comments going through chat this whole time, like, oh my gosh, yes, taking notes, like so much good information. So I think this was really helpful for a lot of people. Let's go in backwards order and do some outros. We're going to start with Sadie. Me, okay. Um, I am Sadie. I am a writer, editor, sometimes artist on uh, DM's Guild. You can find me. I am gearing up to do a few projects next year. I'm kind of in slow period right now, but I have a game that I'm wanting to make, some across Aberfan adventures mm. that I'm thinking of writing. Um, so you can find me on Twitter or my website. Meredith is amazing and just posted those in the chat. Um, thank you, Meredith. Uh, and uh, yeah, please chat with me. I'm anxious, but friendly. <laughs> That's a mood. Justice. <laughs> I'm always scared during outros that I'm going to reveal a project I'm working on that I'm not supposed to. So I have to be very careful. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Justice, uh, at Justice Armin on Twitter, www.justicearmin.com. I wrote a, a long article a few weeks back about getting started on the DMs Guild that has a bunch of links in it. If you liked this, I would say go check that out. Um, we've got a Kickstarter going on at, at Beetle and Grimm's right now um, for our character chronicle. And uh, yeah, just, just looking forward to... Um, doing more creating, doing more projects, and uh, come say hi on Twitter. Can't say, can't wait to see what you two continue to create. I am Lisa Penrose. I'm the brand manager for Dungeon Masters Guild. You can follow DMs Guild at DMs underscore guild on Twitter and Instagram and search Dungeon Masters Guild on Facebook for our group and page. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at Lisa Penrose. That's Lisa with a Y. Um, and uh, in addition to being the brand manager for Dungeon Masters Guild, I am the host of a podcast called Behold Her Podcast. So if you like conversations in tabletop, the latest episode just came out. So listen to it wherever you listen to to podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, to hear about femmes and small business. Uh, but uh, thank you again, everyone, for tuning into this lunch break with One Bookshelf. We're taking next week off because U.S. Thanksgiving, but we'll be back in December with some more awesome content for you all. Uh, so thank you, and everyone, take care. Bye. I Bye. ate so much.